Check this out. Oh, look, you'd be Ooh. getting. <laughs> ah. That's pretty fancy. I misspelled ortho unorthodox, but. <laughs> not really an unorthodox, but it's not the way the thing was designed to be used, I think. It was probably the most accurate way to put it. There's nothing exciting there. Wow, that's better than Hollywood, Dan. <laughs> okay, that's now. Very well done, yes. Okay, so today Gordon is going to talk. Uh, Gordon, is yours a half hour or so? Yeah, I can probably make it stretch that far. It's going to be very talky, but yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. it can be short because I think Rick and yeah. I have a lot. All right, okay. Uh, so we'll Hope. we'll go through Gordon's and then we'll do the self-introductions of everybody and then Rick and I will talk about Eagles Auditorium. So uh, I guess I should say welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming. And... Let me also say that if you want to be on the mailing list for this group, uh, chat me or I, I think I have your email addresses anyway, but chat me as saying I'm not on it and I want to be on it. Uh, and when people think of something they want to share, they will send you a note. They will send the group a note. So thank you again, everybody. And let's go to Gordon. Okay. And, and everybody so mute your mic when you're not yeah. talking. So Soundfield Microphones, Ambisonics, those guys, those of you who are in AES and have read a lot of the papers from the, you know, from 30 years ago, are probably aware of Michael Gerson and Pete Craven, who were students, mathematics students, funnily enough, who had a keen interest in sound and recordings. And uh, they went to Oxford University together in the late 60s, early 70s. And through various thing you know various meetings and whatever they they started messing around with uh, stereo sound first of all um using some for guys who were students some pretty advanced you know some pretty expensive bits of equipment um but michael in particular was a you know a real i i i, I don't know whether i would like to have met him but i do like reading about him he's one of you know that kind of thing and he was convinced that he could do surround sound on coincident, co coincident microphones, i.e. microphones sat right beside one another rather than spread around a room, you know. And he, he claimed, or he's right, because he could actually hear it. Nowadays, of course, you can model it. He, he reckoned he could hear all the high-end phase things happening with multi-microphone ambient recordings, you know, like of orchestras or choirs or vocal groups or whatever in churches and chapels and big venues. And he was a huge fan of Alan Blumlein, um, who was a bit of a guy. And he developed, he worked out ways of doing stereo recording that became kind of the standard. And one of the ways he did it, and bear with me a second while I get this stupid thing to fire up here. Um, one of the ways he he did that was he used mid side techniques, which was basically a mono cardio. Well, initially he did it with two figure of eight mics, but it settled down eventually in the sort of standard way of doing mid side for a lot of stereo recordings in particular. And this is what Michael and his pals used initially uh, when they were doing the recordings and the, before they sort of started playing with angle mics was this system and kind of what you do with these and it was handy for the broadcast people in particular because it folds down to mono unlike any other split um, stereo system because you've got the middle mic acting as a mono feed and then you use diff it's differential. So you, you're positive of the figure eight, the left hand one comes in and that gives you your left side. And then by inverting the phase or the polarity of the right hand, the back side of the uh, figure of eight ribbon you got or figure of eight capsule you got your right stereo and by combining those two you could make it a wide stereo or a narrow stereo Now Michael and Peter had started messing around and they actually used this microphone one of these type four of these type of micro first of all they used three to see if they could get a stereo pattern and then they started playing around with four of these and these are little Calrec microphones they're strange little mics they have a very odd uh, eq kind of sound to them they're useful for some things and um, but i can understand but the guys peter and 
and in particular, who was the electronics man. Uh, I think Michael was the ideas guy, and Peter was very much the electronics guy. They worked out a way of EQing these, so when they had four of them stuck together, they got quite a respectable sound. And they did a recording in 1971 using these all tied together, pointing in the kind of format like that. The pictures that I can find of it are very are not very good pictures. Uh, so this is how they did it. And so basically, these are cardioid capsules, but they're actually really they're, t they're set up as MS pairs. So at an angle, so like that would be one pair of MS speakers, MS microphones there, and that or one, and this would be another pair here. And by combining these through some really crazy electronics, which must have you know, they're an analog. It might, the design and the math for that must have been absolutely brutal. But they managed to do it. And uh, there was a, uh, a thing in, in the UK at that time called the National um, Research Development Council. And basically the idea of them was graduate research graduates could approach them and say, look, I've got this idea. Can we get funding to develop it? And Peter and... Uh, Michael managed to, uh, Michael in particular, managed to get some grants or get some permission from, uh, and primarily because they met a professor in Derby who had also been playing with this 3D sound thing, you know, height, including height as well as horizontal sound, um, called Peter Felgett. And between, he sponsored them to the National uh, Research Co Development Council. And so for a few years, they messed around with these and they ended up with what we now know as the sound field microphone using this kind of layout of capsules. It took them about three or four years to get it, but they got it working. And I'm not really going to try and go any further into how the things work. If you want to read it, there's plenty of, new, of papers of how they actually got it sorted out and got it working. Um, because I am I know a bit about how these work, mainly because uh, one of my friends was a big enthusiast about them. But you could go on for a day and not get much further with it. This is the the guts of a sound field microphone. Um, actually, that picture, yeah. And what you can see there is a bunch of electronics. And those electronics are actually EQs because the capsules were actually quite compromised. They were classic calorie, uh, cal uh, caloric capsules and they had a very high, um, fairly high boost, about 7K on them. That, that little 1050 mic I showed you there has that. So the, one, one of the first things they had hassle with was they had to develop uh, a way of killing that so that it actually worked properly. And this here was the Mark IV processor. So what happened was the microphone plugged in to this and it would then emit the four channels from the microphone as well as a stereo left and right. Because the ambisonic thing, mm, what, yeah. so what basically you did with these was plug the, the, the microphone into this. And on the back of it, you could get the four outputs, the four different style uh, outputs from the microphone, which were the W1 was like an Omni mic. And then you'd X and Y and Z. And the X was the front to back. Y was left, or, uh, and Y was left to right. And Z was up and down. And if you used the controls on the front of these processors, you could effectively make it a wide or narrow stereo when you're recording from it. And then once you'd recorded the four tracks, the trick was to make sure the gains are all exactly the same. This is the first thing we learned how when we were using these. I know more about these from using them in the field than actually, you know, all the theory about it and all the rest of it. And then you could play it back in and actually relative, if you had, one of the hard parts about doing, um, ambient recording was there was always a noise or you couldn't get the microphone exactly where you needed it. And one of the benefits of these things was for us in doing stereo recordings was, first of all, we we're just rigging one mic that weighed about three pounds up in the air instead of half a dozen fragile ribbon mics and trying to work out the best places to put them and then discover we hadn't actually got it, but the live event had finished and that. So these things let you do a lot of and can you read this thing? This is this was a later version that let us do surround sound as in traditional TV surround sound. And this is what made the sound field mics popular. It's a little fuzzy. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's very stretched. I can't make it any better than that. I'm sorry. But basically, you took the four inputs, the top left-hand side there, you took the four inputs from the mic, 
and you stuck it into this processor rack here and it could emit it. There was cards you put in the back of it. That's got a five to one surround sound, which was the common surround sound to begin with. This is later on. This is getting up into the 2000s now. Hey, and Gordon, can you, can you go back to the last slide? Yep. So is it, am I correct that the microphone input on the right would be like when you, when you were recording and then for mixing, you would use those ins on the bottom? Well, there was two, several ways. This is what I'm just about, I, I'm, I'm kind of going to give up the pictures in a minute or two because I couldn't, you know, it was really difficult to get decent pictures of these things. Um, basically how, and more talk about how we actually use them. But yeah, basically with this, this is the Mark IV processor. This was the first one I saw. Um, and basically what you had, we generally speaking used them uh, straight to stereo, left and right, uh, because it would often go out in live broadcast. But what you could do is take these four, uh, the top row ones, hang on, I'm pointing at this in the screen, that's stupid. Um, these four B format outs and put them onto four tracks of a tape deck, you know, a tape recorder. And then later on after, if you're doing post-production, you could go back and put the four tracks back into here. And then manipulating these controls here, you could change whether it, oh, sorry, you could go up and down, left and right, you know, and try and narrow it in a bit so you could lose the, uh, the ambience if it was too much or if there was, you know, the inevitable rustly sweetie paper down your bottom right-hand side or whatever. You know, that was a famous example of a recording we were doing. Uh, you could do that in post-production, and that was an absolute godsend for the guys doing movie sound. Um, if you listen to Harry Potter, the Harry Potter films, all the ambient stuff in the, um, you know, the likes of the dining room and stuff like that, that was all done with a single sound field microphone stuck in the middle of the room, basically, while everybody was running around inside the, the studio, the big studio that we were recording that in. Um, that's where these were brilliant, and if, bear with me a second. This here was the one that I used almost all the time. This was the portable version. This was an ST350, and this became the default run around, grab your, your ambience microphone. Um, I loved this thing. I really did, and I really wish I could have bought one, but as I said to Dan earlier, you could have bought a very good car for the price of that, and that was the cheapest one. Uh, that there retailed for getting up for £3,000 and quite a bit more if you had to buy an extended cable for it, which you inevitably had to do, um, you know, to connect the microphone to the little processor thing. But that would run on camera batteries. And uh, now we get to the abuse bit. I went to Africa with a, a charity, and the idea was to record some local musicians to try and raise money for them, as well as a film production about the, what was happening. It was during, it was not long after um, Live Aid, and it was about bringing in, you know, the, some of the results from the Live Aid thing in 1985. Um, and it was just, you know, it was a film, but also at the same time, we decided to take over some recording equipment. And I took, I managed to get a budget together and, and rented one of these things. And we went across with this, to, it was brand new, the 350 of this particular model had literally just come out. And we went away across to Northern Africa and the guys who were doing the filming, the rear microphones broke. I don't understand to this day how they managed it, but they managed to break every single bit of audio kit they had connected to their camera. Uh, and I ended up improvising and sticking this thing in end fire mode on top of his camera while he went round and filmed it. Um, and it was really, really interesting when we went back and played back the recordings later you could actually almost do virtual reality with the thing. If you sat, it was hard to do because we were doing it live, you know, manually, but nowadays with computing software, uh, it, it, you can see how good it was. And we accidentally had done an early VR virtual recording with this thing. The way every time his camera moved around, obviously the three, you know, the 360 um, pickup of the microphone was moving with him. And by using the controls for aiming it, you could. We, we were <laughs> we actually played with it for the better part of a couple of hours, uh, messing around just to see and follow what the camera was pointing. If the camera went right, we made the microphone, the microphone's natural pickup went right, but we could emphasise that slightly, and it was fascinating seeing how that worked. But that there thing, I really wish I'd, I could have bought that. It was an incredibly tough microphone. Um, for all it had the four 
you know, that, that's it. That's the inside of it. And these little diet, these things are literally hanging on top of a little bubble of rubber, you know, the, the capsules just there. I mean, that there was like a squishy sponge. I never broke one of these. And we had them out in the rain. Okay, they were in rye coats and stuff, but we had them out in the rain and the freezing cold. They actually had a small heater mounted here to dry out the capsules, you know, if they got damp or cold. And I think part of that, that partly helped helped him survive. But, you know, we, we used to put these in the middle of football. You know, you go to a soccer match. And this is when it started to really kick in. This, the sound field mic was probably a very niche thing until the World Cup in 1996, I think it was. Or, sorry, 2000, where is it? Uh, 2006 World Cup, when 12 of these British-made, very niche microphones ended up in Germany, you know, home of the Bosch microphone, record doing the surround sound for the, because the, the 2006 World Cup was the first surround sound sports thing that Sky did. And it really probably the first popular surround sound TV broadcast in the UK. And there was one of these in each football field. And between them and half a dozen spot mics, that's what they did, the whole surround sound thing. And that really started to kick the sound field and the whole surround thing back up again. And uh, they started becoming popular. If you know, a few years back, if you'd mentioned a few years before that, if you mentioned the surround, the sound field microphone, the only people that really knew them were guys that were doing foley work or radio work, radio broadcast work. Nobody else really appreciated what they were, despite the fact that quite a number of recording studios in the UK used them as vocal mics uh, because it gave them the options of cardioid or hypercardioid or wide or whatever else. Nobody really knew them outside of quite a niche product. Um, and nowadays, Rode in particular have re have bought the Soundfield name, and they've taken the guy. Uh, what was his name again? Sorry, excuse me, Peter Shelbeck, who was the guy that developed the software that let the 350 work as a plugin, and that was the other thing that opened it up because you were able to run it as a plugin and do your automation on your DAW, so that let you actually program the movements of the sound to match the the kind of ambience that your video had. And that, again, started to open it up, really, and bring it out the niche market. Are they useful today? Well, yeah, they, they, they've really started to come into their own with the virtual reality world, the gamer world. The little road one, the one that I showed near the beginning, that one, is actually small enough to mount on top of a camera. Um, it is literally the the body of it is not any bigger than something like a CK, uh, you know, a, a, an audio, uh, an AKG four five one. Uh, okay, the head's a bit bigger, but it's not that big. And they've got they've got a windscreen, which ironically looks like the very very first prototype uh, sound field, like a big round lollipop that goes in the top of it. And you can mount that on a camera, move around with it, record it, mount, put the the um. Uh, you know, the video in line with your DAW and the thing actually gives you the whole virtual reality, 3D, you know, height, left, right and all the rest of it. And because it's on top of the camera, it's like a point of view thing. So you, you don't, it's very, very easy to process it. You don't, you're not having to kind of watch the film and try and program at the same time. The, the microphone almost does it itself. Really what you're trying to do is control, just control the width and the, you know, the actual overall uh, size of the sound field. Um, I, I used these for a bit, along with some of the guys in the BBC. They, they, were, they, they were very vanilla, very, uh, people got quite opinionated and quite polarised by them. For a number of years, the BBC used one of these to record the, just one in the Albert Hall to record the radio broadcast uh, of the proms. Um, they had a couple of spot mics, obviously, for soloists and stuff like that. One of the things that they noticed were because it was very real, very, um, it could sound quite dull uh, compared to the normal way of recording orchestras and things like that. But that was because the, amb the ambience was so big around about it. And it took them a little while to learn how to use it, particularly in places like the Albert Hall where they were used to and they had a very good way of setting up you know, the microphones and stuff like that. It took a little bit of convincing, I think, to start using it. But ultimately, they started to use it almost exclusively for things like that. And it, setting it up was so much easier than dashing around trying to put mics all over the place, especially if there's a live audience or something in the way, you know, you couldn't just put a mic stand where you really wanted to put it. These things were, you know, if you were slightly off-centre, 
or slightly too high or slightly too low, which is the more usual one, you could do a little bit with it. There's a feature on the microphones things, which is not apparent, but it, you can actually do, it's called dominance, or it's called dominance on the older analog units, where it effectively zoomed in or zoomed out from the, you know, the sound source. So with a bit of juggling with that, you could, especially in post-production, you could actually correct for, you know, not so clever microphone positioning and things like that. I liked it for that, and the people that I worked with in amongst the broadcasting here liked it for that as well, because they were practical radio people. But there was a few of the old guard in particular were not overly impressed, you know, and de-skilling us, you're not letting us position our mics in the way we want to do it, etc., etc. So nowadays the um, recordings for the likes of the proms, if you look it up, I was trying, I know there is a recording of the 1978 last night of the proms, which was the very first national broadcast of a sound field microphone, but I can't find it. I know it was on the website not that long ago because I did listen to it, but they seem to have taken a lot of these things down recently. Um, but that was the first time it was ever used live. And... Uh, yeah, it was good. It was different, but it was good. And uh, they actually used, uh, part of it was recorded using the traditional microphone arrays, which are usually a bunch of ribbon mics in coincident pairs scattered around the room. Uh, some would be picking up the audience, some would be picking up the, uh, the orchestra. And partway through the, the recording, you could actually hear it change over to the sound field because the ambience just became much more folk much more real if you sounding. Uh, a little bit deeper, perhaps, if you're going to criticise it from an audio quality point of view. But, uh, and also the original Soundfield Mark III was quite a noisy mic, and you can actually hear the mic noise go up a bit as well. Um, but uh, I liked them. I found them very, very useful. As I could have afforded one, I would have bought it. Um, and, and actually now you can see now that Rode have brought out a pretty good one. Uh, and it's still got that some of the original sound feed field people working for it for them. So I suspect about it's about as real as a sound field used to be. I might, you know, if I can find a spare few hundred, eight hundred pounds, I might actually buy one ultimately. If you're into doing any kind of foley or ambient work, especially nowadays with the way VR is going, you know, virtual reality stuff is going, I honestly think these are the are the Sennheiser Ambio mic. There's also one made in New Jersey, um, but that needs a lot of little fiddly electronics, even more fiddly electronics to work. These new ones literally come out on four XLRs and go straight into your DAW or your little portable recorder. Zoom make a recorder that's designed to work with this thing. Uh, I think there's a, a version of the Tascams now that can work straight with it as well. The one critical thing is you've got to get the gains exactly the same for the, the four outputs. Otherwise, it just doesn't work, or it's a menace to try and get it to work properly. Um, and I find them quite useful. And, I, and as I say, I'm, especially if, this, if our business is going to become more matching audio to video again, I think I'm going to be looking at buying something like this, either the Sennheiser or the or the, the this little road one, whatever one's available at the time, I suspect, um, just because they are so much easier to deal with than running around with different collections of mics. I mean, how we used to do sound or how the BBC do radio sound, I don't know if they do it in America, they probably do, was we had a mid-side array inside a RICO and you would go and do your electronic news gathering in particular. You would use the mid mic when you were doing interviews and then if you wanted to get a little bit of B-roll, you know, for scenery stuff before and after, while before the news bit started, you would have it out in mid-side and get the stereo Often that was collapsed down to mono, but that was how it was done. And, that, and this thing here can do all of that. Forget the fact that you can also do the 3D sound part with it, but it did the whole mid-side thing so much more convincingly and so much more neatly that I find it a very, very handy broadcast device. I've actually used one for live output onto a PA once. Um, we put one microphone down around a, a string quartet one time. Uh, who would have been a bit snippy about putting mics anywhere near them for the PA. And uh, we actually had one of these out because initially we were going to record it, but th there was copyright issues, so we didn't record it. But it was actually sitting at the back of the room. So we stuck it down and tried it. Yes, it worked, but you were actually just using it as a very clever cardioid mic that day. Uh, it did let us probably, actually probably did get quite good gain before feedback. 
just by playing with the, the width of the pickup on it. Did we get any benefit from it being an ambisonic mic? Not really, but it was quite handy because we were able to play with the pickup of it because we just had the one mic position. It's something if I got one, I might experiment with a bit more because I do quite, like Dan, I do quite a lot of acoustic kind of live work and, you know, we do occasionally get people that don't like having the microphone anywhere near them but then complain because they can't be heard across the room or people in the audience complain more likely. Um, so, yeah, good fun. If anybody wants to ask some questions about using the thing, not so much how it works, you can give us a shot, you know, have a... I think that's about all I can really say about it now without repeating myself too much. I had a question about the connector that it uses. That yeah, it's a Limo 12 pin, the original okay. one. Okay. Um, the newer ones now just have, a, it's probably, I don't know how many pins are actually on the bottom of the mic, but it must be still somewhere near 12 because you've got four, well, it'll be eight probably at the very least, so, um, or nine, so it'll be something like that. Or, yeah. yeah. So I got a question. Um, the stereo output of the original yeah. CalRec mic, was yeah. that matrixed? Yes, that's how, that's the whole thing. That's how it works. And so that it was matrixes really, inside. Yeah, that was the clever bit about it. Um, these two, twin, these two, it's actually another guy, Richard, 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 hold on, I'll get his name. I wrote them all down. Da, da, da. Richard Lee and Peter Craven. And so it looks to me by reading a lot of the stuff I've read about it, I didn't, you know, I hadn't really read a lot of the history of the thing. Mike Gerson was the ideas man and yeah. the critical listening guy. And Pete Craven and a guy called Richard Lee were the electronic dudes. And they kind of worked out the matricing that was required for this. I think Michael did all the math for it. You know, remember Pete Craven was also a maths guy as well, who happened to have a real interest in electronics. So between them, they worked out all the, it's me. How I think it works and how I'm, I, was, I think I was told or whether I, I'm just maybe not right up the right tree. Uh, it seems to work by relative phases of the, caps, of the capsules, much the same way as a normal mid-side thing works. So it's crazy pan-potting, but I think they're not really pan-potting levels so much as more the phase of the thing. Yeah, they're panning the phase. That's what yeah. they're doing. So yeah. interesting bit of history. That system, that, that Gerzen thing, he mm -hmm. was like the mortal enemy of, Sh of Peter Scheiber in the United right. States. I know he was. Uh, yeah, so you've read <laughs> some of that stuff? Yeah, so, I read a lot about that, yeah. Yeah, so, there were, so it's like they fought to get the LP format, and yeah. then they fought to, and then Dolby ended up taking Scheiber's design. Yeah. And um, it's interesting because just today I had a phone conversation with Jim Fosgate, who was right, right in the middle of all this surround sound stuff. Yeah. And Foz told me that Ambisonics people were his competition trying to get into Harmon with what became Dolby, um, Pro, um, Dolby Pro Logic 2, the digital Dolby Pro Logic. Mm -hmm. And Harmon ended up licensing Ambisonics, and that's how Sennheiser, or it's not, I think AKG, it went, what's the one that Harmon owns? Is it Sennheiser or AKG? AKG. AKG. Okay, AKG. so AKG had one had a surround mic at one time, and it did not do very well in the, micro, in the, in the uh, field. But yeah. um, Ambisonics <laughs> was always there in the background with Dolby. Yeah. And, there was and a link with Dolby in this country because of Dolby. Yeah, the Dolby is Dolby Brothers, isn't it? Um, they they met with Michael and and Peter um, around about the era of when they hadn't quite developed a microphone, you know, right. the simple microphone, but just around about that era. Um, Michael was quite against the Dolby tape system as well. Interestingly, he claimed he could hear it. Uh, well, he probably could. The old A systems were not the best, but he didn't particularly like it. But he, he kind of seen the point of it as well, if you know what I mean. Yeah. One of the issues they had with the original recordings was um, the dynamic range of a classical recording is massive. And the older tape machines, it wasn't until they started using the proper Revoxes and things like that that they actually managed to get recordings without clipping. Uh, they also had terrible trouble playing it back because the only amplifiers they had. Uh, to play back a lot of their ideas were quad valve amps that were really quiet and they had a biggish room and it just didn't work out. It's amazing that they actually got anywhere. But the story with Dolby was that um, the Dolby brothers were looking at the system and quite interested in it. And it was going through this National Research Council thing in the late 70s and a government change happened and the council lost all its funding. So the final developing of the microphone got landed onto CalRec. 
Now, Calrec, I don't know how much you know of Calrec in America, but Calrec was one of these little backroom, really clever shops. If you know what I mean, they built some really out there stuff. That little microphone that I showed you a minute at the beginning, the little 1050 uh, microphone and the CC series microphones, they developed those in the late, well, early 60s, I guess, really, uh, started developing those. They were amongst the first microphones to use uh, 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 an aluminium diaphragm. They weren't mylar, they were aluminium diaphragms in those things. And they're very interesting little mics and very, very robust. I mean, that one there that I've got, there I've got four of them, and they're easily 55 years old, and they've been around the world, like, you know, really properly around the world. You know, used as drum overheads, you name it. And so Calrec were in the process of developing the original idea for the Soundfield mic, but they were slow at working it because it was literally 10 guys in a factory in the middle of Yorkshire. And I think if they'd got that together and had that working, maybe, you know, a year more, if that funding had stayed there for another year, the story might have been a lot different. You know, I really well, think it might have been a lot different. There was another thing that I, my understanding with Gerzen's way of doing matrixing, you can't cut it into a record. No. You can no. cut Shiver's way into a record. Gerzen's, you yeah. have to use tape. Yeah, that's right. Because it was the, 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 the society that they were all part of was the tape society. You know, that was part of the name of it. You know, what was it University of Oxford Tape Society or something like that? It was the whole thing. Wow. You know, um, they literally, I, I've just, I read a bit about it today. Uh, Steve Thornton, who was one of the guys of the organ, of the, not really, he wasn't really the, into the tech side of it, but he was part of that uh, group. And he writes, he's quite, there's quite a lot of his stuff. The reason I haven't put anything up on this is because it's quite heavily copyrighted. It's owned by the uh, Oxford University Archive. Um, uh, but the, if you can, you can read it, it's online. And uh, they, they literally went looking for, you know, it was almost like a small business they had running. <laughs> They'd go around taping, you know, the music stuff that happens in, or in, in or Oxford Uni. It still does to this day. And, uh, you know, and make charge for it and sell it and things like that, you know. <laughs> it's like a branch of the university union, really, is probably the best way to describe it. All right, one more question, then we got to move on. Yeah. Anybody? Nope, silence. Okay. Thanks, Gordon. <laughs> that was really interesting. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. That was great. I, say, I wish I could have found some recordings that I could put links to, but I just can't. I can tell you where you can find all of Michael Gerson's recordings. Uh, they're in the British Music Library. Um, you can apply, and it doesn't cost, but it takes a while to get the... Um, to get the uh, the permission to download it, mm -hmm. um, I was going to try and do it, but they're shut just now. They're just not answering their emails, or you know, nothing seems to be happening. I put an application in the beginning of the week to get into it again. I, I did have a, a, a membership a while ago. It's worth probably doing if you want to, if you're actually interested in some of this stuff, especially yourself there. Um, you know, with the the quadraphonic thing, Tom. It might be something to to have a little look. Uh, you know, if you want to see some of the stuff that became, you know, what was the British version, I guess, of quadraphonic, you know? Yeah, I read um, Gerzen's diaries that are on the Oxford. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was, it was, was, it was, it was interesting because I, I had no, it, you know, it's kind of like Bloomline versus Bell Labs. It's kind of like a fake yeah, yeah. Uh, Gerzen was a big fan of Bloomline, clearly, you know, just yeah. by the way he recorded stuff, you know, um, yeah. He was a real interesting guy to listen to. He I started going to AES conventions when he mm -hmm. was presenting or commenting at length from the audience. And I'm sure yeah. Gary heard him too. Maybe Tom? Yeah, he was I did. Guy. No, I, yeah. I, I didn't. Ah. I think he was one of these people that's fascinating to read about, but I'm not entirely sure I'd like to be around him for a huge amount of time. He I think Shiver was the same. <laughs> he, he didn't hold back at all. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing was what I didn't realize was he was involved with the beginning of the you know the the software pro, uh, company Waves. Mm. He was involved with the developing some of the algorithms that those guys used to model the you know the compressors and whatever that they do. Mm. That was probably his last project before he died. Actually, he was working with that. The was that Dave Amos? I used. The Sorry? software is is very. The white papers all got Gerson all over, all over it. Yeah. Is that Dave Amel's guys? I have no idea. 
We just know them as waves. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Janie. Earth to Janie. Yeah. Is the British Library that uh, Gordon is talking about the same uh, organization that's going to accept your recordings? Yes. Um, it's, it's the British Library National Sound Archive yeah, where, I'm sending my, uh, where I'm sending uh, my recordings. Yeah. If I remember rightly, it's C236 is the collection of records that uh, Michael, the collection of recordings for Michael Garrison. It's mm. organized, basically you have, it's a very clever thing. I've used it a few times. It's the, the music library, the British Music Library is very cleverly organized. It follows BBC um, precedents because largely it is a BBC basis. Uh, it basically you have a collection number and then every sort of recording has got its own individual number. So it's usually something like say two, C236 dot 75 or 72 or something like that. If you're interested in some of the early audio recordings, Bloomline stuff's in there as well. If you're interested in some of that, it's probably worth digging it out and having a good look at. All right, thanks, Gordon. Yeah, thank you. So if you're on the freeway going southbound, I-5 in Seattle, and you take the Union Street exit, within the first block is this building on the right, and that's pretty much what it looks like now. It says Eagles Auditorium. And uh, back in the day, it started, it was, that building was built sometime around 1920, 1925. And this was the earliest, you guys are seeing this Pioneer Nights, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, here's something in 1922. Here's something else uh, featuring Seattle's own blind sensational singing star. I couldn't find a date on this one. Uh, I'm doing this to show that there were events there, have been events there for quite a while. This is from 53 with Bobby Bland and Richard Berry who wrote Louie Louie, uh, as you can see it there. And then in 58, there was still shows. No, nothing on these posters saying who's putting these on, as near as I can tell. James Brown was there in February of 67. And now we're getting towards the time when it gets turned into something else. Uh, and I, I wanted to give a little background. In 1965-ish, there were these things called the acid tests down in San Francisco. And uh, uh, as talked about in Tom Wolfe's Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, and this is the third one, and the Grateful Dead are in it, and Neil Cassidy and the Merry Pranksters from Ken Kesey's uh, group were part of it. And they had these things called the Trips Festivals, and they happened first, I believe, in San Francisco, and these, and then they spread to other places. And there was this one up in 66 in Vancouver. And then in 67, there was uh, one in Seattle. And Rick, you and I were talking about that beforehand. So it was Trips Lansing who put it on. And everything that I saw said that it was a guy named Trips Lansing. But you're saying that that was not a person. It was a company. Is that right? Yeah. Um, Which makes more sense. There was, um, there were two, maybe three, um, uh, Luther Rabb, a bass player, and Sid Clark, who was um, a business guy. And I think that Paul, um, oh crap, the name was in my head 10 seconds ago and now it's poof. Hmm. Um, anyway. Uh, he was a guitar player, and I think he was part of this also. But they, they were just, they were like a local uh, promotion and production company. Paul Goldsmith. Hmm. Um, and so um, Luther play, played in a band called um, The Emergency Exit. And I think Goldsmith was the guitar player in that band. And they were like a power trio or something. Okay, so 
Um, I wanted to show the interior of the place, and this is slightly out of sequence, and I couldn't figure out how else to do it. This is a, uh, that's Boyd Grafmeyer on the right, who was the promoter, and we'll talk about him later, but I wanted to show the interior. Considerably younger. Yes. And this will be a little animation here, which gets into, so you can see we're looking towards the back of the room right now. And the audience entered through that big black area at the bottom. And there's a balcony up above and the stage is behind us. And uh, these pictures are from 1968 and the PI, Seattle Post Intelligencer, uh, they must have done something about it. And it's got a real elaborate ceiling, which is uh, still there. And, and this building is still there, as you saw by the earlier picture. Do you remember the capacity of the room? I want to say it's around a thousand uh, legal, yeah. but I'm sure there was a couple thousand or more there on different well, occasions. And it would also depend on whether you were um, seating or just um, festival seating. Yes, and it was all festival seating. This was the this was the way it was for a concert. People sat on the floor. Right now we're looking at the stage, and. The curtains there are confusing to me uh, because I assume they're from four projections uh, to be on stage with the, the light shows. They were using slide projectors and movie projectors and uh, overheads. Overheads. And what am I doing here? So here we're going to zoom in a little bit. And, and the, to, to project on either of these screens, you've got to point sideways at it. The projector's got to be in front of it. So I'm guessing that's what these tables on the balcony were, that there was some event going on where somebody is up here pointing sideways. And during the time I was there, at least, the light show was in the back of the room and the only curtains were around the stage itself. That's my memory also. Yeah. yeah. So here's a close-up of those uh, tables. And I'm zooming in on the stage, and I'm sorry about how blurry this is, but these are literally the only two pictures I could find of the interior of the, of the space during those years. And gonna, you can, go ahead. I was gonna say, Dan, uh, not having been there, based on your photos, it's reminding me uh, a fair amount of the Leeds refectory, about half the size though. Mm. Yeah, there are, there are some similar characteristics for sure. And and this is the half the size of the Leeds thing. Well, at least based on your photos, at, you know, in in Leeds there's that overhead walkway that kind of cuts the room in half or so and it Yes. Your your from your photos it looks like it's about, you know, the the one half the front of, half of, of yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And what I remember is that there were these protrusions on the front of the stage, as shown here, that look like they're stairways. But I remember those protrusions being there as platforms for the PA system. Yes, you remember right. Yeah, okay. And zooming in a little closer, um, the part that I'm going to talk about later of where I was during the thing is right behind these, where the speakers would be. I would be sitting there. So this, the, the speakers that I remember being there were used in part at the Seattle Pops Festival. And this is one of the pictures that I took there with my mom's camera that I borrowed the one day, one of the days that I went. And I'm pretty sure that's Bo Diddley on stage. And uh, as we zoom in on the, on the PA here, um, the speakers that I think were part of the Eagle system are on the top level, that one, uh, in the middle, and the equivalent one on the bottom. And I thought there was three per side with some Altec horns on the top at Eagles during my time there. Um, this other stuff is what Rick and I were talking about at the, uh, uh, during the Hendrix event that we had that was all added that was came from somewhere else and that's one of those voice of the theater theater speakers on the left there the big great big guy maybe in the tall one 
the tall on one. the lower it's, level yeah it's not the it's yeah a7 but it's a no a that's that's like an a2 or an a4 yeah yeah i think it's an a4 and i think an a2 was two of those side by side yeah you know the idea was it was modular yeah okay and i think oh and they had monitors also here and at Eagles, and they might have been the same speakers, but I remember the Eagles ones as being on little casters sitting on the floor. Uh, and you can see over on the left side, I, I can't see my cursor, but there's there's one speaker. Those are the total monitors. Is these, and, and that looks like one of those Altec utility boxes for a 604 or something, maybe. Can you see? Where was this, Dan? This here is at the Seattle Pops Festival uh, yeah, on June 25th, July 25th, 6th and 7th, 69, at Gold Creek Park out in Woodenville. Gotcha. And okay. Boyd, that was a Boyd Grafmeyer event. And uh, it was uh, the same sound guy who did Eagles was at that. This is Ike and Tina Turner on the stage. But these speakers are up on little stands, and they weren't at Eagles, as I recall. So if if you um, if you go back to the um, the first Seattle Pops shot, there you go. Okay, now uh, you see the scaffold with the flags on it. Yes, it Oops. looks like there's a long throw horn on that. There is. Okay. There is indeed, and there's a whole bunch of horns scattered all over that thing. We had people hadn't figured out that one speaker to one area is the way to go but these weren't powerful enough anyway to do well our horn horns were the only way you could get enough acoustic output given how big amplifiers were at the time yes yeah so i'm going to go on here and what i remember there was some uh, 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 console-ish thing with a bunch of Altec 1567As in it as the mixer. And it was something like this. This is just an assemblage of the same thing. Do you, what was the mixer there? Do you remember that? Are you asking me? Yes. No, I, I was gone by then. But when but, you were there. Oh, when I was there, the, um, well, I'll get there. But, okay, so never mind then. Yeah. Um, okay. Those... The 1567s were really common for rock and roll PA back in that day. And mm -hmm. with that setup there, it could have been that the uh, fifth mixer was used as a, uh, as a sub mixer to combine the other four, but it could be that all five of the mixers were just wired in parallel. Yeah. And Alltech uh, had a provision on the back via a terminal strip to allow that. Yeah, cool. And I don't remember how many they were, but that's how I would have done it if it was me to have one as a submixer. So here's what it is looking like now. It's now the ACT Theater, and we're looking towards the stage, and there's a stairway on the left that goes up to the balcony. The balcony on this side, I don't know what's there. The balcony on the right side is the uh, control booths and stuff, I think. And zooming way in, you can see that the stage has no stairway getting up to it on, on the side that we can see. Uh, I don't know how well this is coming over Zoom at all, but it's it's blurry to me, and I assume it's even blurrier to you. It's a study in blur. So this is what I sent out to you guys uh, who are on the mailing list, and it points out that uh, the building was the Unity Church of Truth from the 50s until 1960, Martin Luther King spoke there in 1961, and it was a concert venue from what we're going to see, 67. And here's that Trips Lansing thing with Sid Clark managing. This is what was in, I think, History Link, yes. Uh, so this was that first concert of the era of this kind of music with the Daily Flash, who we're going to hear, and Magic Fern, who we're also hearing. And here's a different version of that poster. And it showed the Union Light Company as being the light show for it. And this is on the right, a very primitive description of what happened. That's how I started in this business. And, and uh, I can talk a lot about that. 
you guys have already read that probably. And then there was a second Trips Festival in May of 1967. And in uh, the middle between those two, the Helix newspaper, alternative newspaper started. And here is a poster of the first event in any timeline that I've seen uh, for Country Joe and some other groups with and, I, and I've highlighted the light shows because that's interesting to me. And and in, in the thing that you've gotten, if you didn't get it, send me your email and I'll send you this thing. Uh, the date is highlighted if there's a poster for it. So in July, there's the Grateful Dead. Then the doors came and uh, I'm going to talk later about an interview that I did with Boyd Grafmeyer for my high school newspaper. This was the date, July 23rd and 24th, and that was pivotal in his ability to continue. So then there was the Yardbirds and Moby Grape and then Magic Fern and a bunch of other people. That must have been some kind of special event, that August 20th one. Then the Grateful Dead again. Uh, Lux Sit and Dance light show was the light show that the guy who got me into light shows was part of. So that's only notable for that. Uh, then that one. Then John Handy, the Young Bloods. Now here we get to Rick's part of the program. On October 6th, 1967, the Daily Flash and Flat, Fat Jack performed. And then the Daily Flash were again October 7th and 8th with Charles Lloyd. So, so Rick, I think you should take over from here. So this is a, a, a brief recap of my life and times at the Eagles um, back in the summer of 1967. So what happened was after high school, I was basically kind of clueless and didn't really know how or what I was going to do. I thought I wanted to go to the UW and major in electrical engineering. And so, uh, but high school was basically um, uh, fun and games and a joke. And uh, grades were anything that I, that w grades were what other people had. And so I ended up going to community college because that would keep me clear of the draft. And uh, tried pre-engineering there, which didn't work, transferred to their electronics program, which did work because I had a lot of electronics background prior to that being self-taught. And, uh, but after two years, um, I finished that and I had no transfer options to go to any other school. I maybe could have gone to San Jose State, but that might as well have been on Mars. So, the draft board reclassified me 1A, which means I was fresh meat. And sure enough, I got my draft notice. So for the summer, I got a job um, at a store called Electrocraft, which is oddly enough, around the corner from Eagles. That's sixth and Union, Eagles was seventh and Union. Uh, they were competitor to another store called Magnolia Camera and Hi-Fi which is, uh, which was across town in the, in the rich people's section. Um, and Magnolia is now owned by Best Buy and Electrocraft is history. But they sold all make and manner of audio equipment all the way from um, home mono equipment through home stereo and commercial sound. Uh, they were the Ampex dealer and they did rentals. And so one day I'm, sitting down in the shop and I was the guy that sat at the front desk and took in your your bad whatever it was and tried to write down what you were telling me about how how it had busted um, and Boyd came in looking to rent a sound system for the Eagles Auditorium and somehow I got hooked up in that and since I had experience doing live sound um, I got tapped to take the gear over and set it up and somehow I ended up being the operator. So here's what we had. We had four A7s and they were deployed on the left and right sides of the stage, right by on the stairway where Dan pointed out that he hung out. There were two Macintosh 275 tube amps, 
one on each side of the stage. And those are stereo amps, 75 watts a channel, and one channel drove one A7, the other channel drove the other A7, and the same thing on the other side of the stage. And of course, the Max had pretty uh, conservative power ratings, so um, I know from experience that a 275 on the bench usually put out 90 to 100 watts. So we had a, a fairly loud and raucous PA system. Um, I had a six channel mic mixer that I had built and um, but that degenerated uh, into just using a Switchcraft passive mixer, which you can see down on the lower left. And that fed a Dynaco um, Hi-Fi preamp set for microphone and that drove the Max. That was it, that was the PA. Um, we used the Switchcraft mixer because being passive, there was no possible way to overload it. Um, we had AKG D707 dynamic mics. And those, um, those were low impedance to begin with and we fed them through um, a step up transformer into the Switchcraft mixer and off we went. Um, so there's a, a drawing of the of how it was set up and the output of the preamp went three ways one way to my ampex recorder for recording and to the two 275s and uh, we only did vocals um, the bands were loud enough to begin with and it was all you could do just to get the vocals over that so that's what we did and the uh, there was some amount of confusion just in making everything work. And so I ended up um, repurposing my, my homemade mixer to do, doing recording. And um, so we'd, we'd mic up the band and the, that mixer would do that and feed one channel of the Ampex and a tap from the PA fed the other channel of the Ampex. Um, there were no monitors because monitors caused feedback. Everybody knows that. So was your, was your mix position right down front like that? Right directly in front of the stage? No, my mix position was backstage. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh, so uh, my mixer was uh, all tubes because transistors hadn't really evolved to that, to um, a better point then. And uh, everything was patched. So... Um, the input fed a transformer, the transformer fed a pair of patch points, there was a preamp between the patch points, and then the output of the preamp fed the mix fader. And um, I don't remember how many channels it was. It was at least six and maybe it was 10. Uh, and the, the patch points around the preamps allowed me to bypass 40 dB a gain. And the preamps were fixed gain this was before anybody had the concept of a gain trim control. So if the source was too loud, you just patched the preamp out and turn the fader up higher. It worked. Uh, and uh, like the Switchcraft mixer, it couldn't be overloaded. Oh, it was mono. So here's the microphones I had. I had AKG 707s for vocals. Electro Voice 655Cs for the guitars. I had a couple of those. I had a Shure 55C, which is the large version of the mic that's commonly called the Elvis mic. And then um, on drums, just as an overhead, I had a AKG D24E. Um, we really didn't have enough inputs to do any more than that. And the drums were plenty loud anyway. Um, and this was just for recording. So I just wanted to capture a semblance of the cymbals and the skins. And just in case for extra mics, we had a Electro Voice 630, which um, you'd have to look it up. Um, a 635A, which um, is the, the common tulip shaped mic like you see a lot of newscasters use. An Electro Voice 676, which was a more modern 664 and then another two, D24, those are my best guesses from 53 years. 
Are all the mics except the 635A uh, cardioids? That one's a mono for sure. The 635A and the 655Cs were omnis. Okay. Okay, thanks. And when about did you go to that from the four channel? I missed that. You had a four channel oh, switchcraft the, mixer and now I think you got the, a 10 channel. The first the first show we did, we used my my tube mixer and then when I settled on trying to record the shows, then I found a different solution to do the vocals. And the different solution for the vocals was the Switchcraft mixer feeding the Dynakit. And what was this mixer that you just described? Um, how do I answer ten, that? With 10 channels. It when did that a, come in? Well, that's what I started out with, but I repurposed it to recording. Oh, uh, okay. So you went from 10 channels to four. Yeah, but I, all we were doing was vocals anyway, so it didn't yeah. matter. Yeah, okay. Just as an FYI, the 630 was Omni as well. Yes, that's right. Okay, thanks. And fairly substantial. I mean, it's a, it's a, a hefty feeling microphone. I'll, and put the link, I'll put the link in the chat. Yeah. Good. And David asked if you were using, if that was an Ampex 602. No, it's an Ampex F44, which is a consumer oh. machine. Wow. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm mixing on headphones. I had a pair of uh, cost headphones that the trade name was Beetlephone. And they had one thing going for them, and that was that they could get really loud. And getting loud was the, was the solution for being able to mix on headphones back then, because you still had to get over the stage noise. Um, pretty much my approach was to find a basic mix and then leave it alone. Let the band get it right or not get it right. Um, getting the balance between the vocal and the band was always a problem. And on headphones, even worse. And since I was really new to this, um, I finally settled on doing, using, treating the two track, the stereo recorder as a two track. So one channel for the band, one channel for the vocals, and then do a mix down after the fact when you could get it right and listen on loudspeakers. So here's our first sample, which is just um, a little bit of the Daily Flash doing Cantaloupe Island. And um, you can hear the mix coming together at the beginning. You can hear the bass overloading severely. I think what I ended up doing there was um, pulling the pot down and quick like a bunny, pull out the patch cords and patch around the preamp and then bring it back in. Um, the daily that's Boyd. <laughs> Here's the bass giving birth. So one, um, let's see, one thing about this recording is it's still dual mono. Um, the right channel was just leakage into the vocal mics and the left channel was the band mix. Just an FYI, Rick, it's uh, coming in mono over Zoom. Oh, okay. Well, we had it stereo earlier. Don't know what happened. You left the room. Yeah, that'll teach me. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So now another band that played was the Magic Fern. I actually liked them. They were pretty good. Um, for And this was the on the 28th of October. I think that was the date. And as an experiment, uh, I just did a left center right mic setup, which was oddly enough remarkably like what Tom Fine's parents did with orchestras. So I just had three tall stands 
with booms up on in front of the stage and three omni mics on it with two 655s for left and right because they were arguably the best mics that I had. Um, and I'm not sure why I settled on omnis, but I did. And I think the center mic was a 635A. And I had the use of the Ampex mixer that you see in the picture. And it has four inputs and the switches above the gain pots allow you to set left, both or right as um, what panning for the, uh, for the source. So the left mic went left, the center mic went to both and the right mic went to right and then the fourth input got the PA system and that was it and um, I kind of took a guess at a mix and and then that's uh, that's what I got on tape turns out it was one of the best recordings I made there two days later I was in the Air Force <laughs> And a poor gal do quite the same Yeah, but my gal, she's smoking good old marijuana I know she'll get stoned just the same I will be there in the morning if I live I will be there in the morning So there you go. So yeah, I, I just put the SoundCloud link to that in the chat for anybody who hadn't heard it. Uh, already it's uh, I it's zoom was kind of clobbering it but if you listen to the SoundCloud link it's really impressive yeah good thank you definitely that sounds as good as the uh, commercial version of that song I think <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say when I listened to the magic fern recordings they really reminded me of the Grateful Dead and when I was looking for pictures uh, uh, looking for posters back when, for the Hendrix uh, talk, I, uh, fa I'm pretty sure, I'm real sure I found one that was for a show in San Francisco with the magic fern in great big letters and Grateful Dead in little tiny letters down below. And I couldn't figure if that was because the Magic Fern were these exotic, this exotic band from Seattle, and the Grateful Dead were some local band. And maybe how could a band from Seattle be hipper than a band from San Francisco? <laughs> I mean, I ask. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't find it when I looked for it again to prepare for this thing. I could not find that same thing that I thought I saw, so maybe it didn't exist. And the Flash used to travel to San Francisco also. I mean, there was just kind of a circuit of, of yeah. these shows. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Thank you. Rick, mm -hmm. say, say Rick did... uh, uh, sorry. Uh, on you go, go ahead, Gordon. All right. Uh, you just you showed that circuit diagram of your mixer. Um, I've got an input channel from my WEM audio, audio master circuit diagram, if you want to see, but that looks like in comparison, because it's about the same age, eh? Yeah, um, you know, I built it around 1966 or so. Yeah, well, the audio masters first came out in 66, 67. But, so, yeah. You know, this was all valves. It was a glass factory. Uh, this thing, the, the, just out of interest, you know, just, you know, just the, the similar, you know, the, the sort of, um, you know, just to show what was happening over here with solid state, if I can get this to. There you go. So that was how it was done, it's solid state, but you know, there's, a, there's one channel strip from a five channel mixer basically. Right. Yeah, I went, went out to the, um, to the website and harvested all those. Yeah, it's pretty cool, you know, just the different, you know, it's quite interesting. Just, as I say, I'd really love to know who the core designer of that circuit, of that little circuit was. And, and I, I can't find it written down anywhere, which makes me think uh -huh. it's really moonlighting, you know. Hey, Rick, did you do sound for and or record any of the Doors shows? So other people have asked me that, and I don't think so. I think I did the sound, but I don't think I recorded. Wow. <laughs> so was your show the first show, the first one, that Country Joe weekend? I think my first show was The Grateful Dead. Ah, uh, okay. So they were doing something else before they got you involved. And, and I, yeah. that, 
that blurb that I showed said that the Helix was putting on shows at the at Eagles, but that Paul Dorpat got tired of being both the promoter of the show and the presenter of or, or the publicizer for the show with the Helix and the presenter, and they found Boyd Grafmeyer to be the presenter, oh, the the, the the promoter. So and and I don't know about that. But I, yeah. do have, I do have some of that in my talk here. Well, and there was also the O'Day connection. Yeah, and let's get, we'll get to that in a minute here. So are you seeing Mercer High Times now? Yeah. Okay, let's go to full screen. So I was a student on the paper in Mercer, the Mercer High Times, and I wanted to prove that it actually said High Times. <laughs> uh, because it was a high school, right? So... I was on the newspaper staff as a senior, and uh, this was my second article for the paper. Uh, I had the idea to go talk to Boyd Grafmeyer because I think I had just started going to the shows. This is March of 1969, and uh, uh, I don't know how, I guess it'll depend on how big your screen is, if you can read that. Here's the first. It's readable. Here's the first part there. And it um, talks further down in here about how he was losing money on his initial shows and uh, was almost out of business and his backers left him. But then the doors happened and that totally turned it around and let him continue to do his thing. That's out of this screen here. Um, this is that picture <clears throat> picture of him in front of the same door to the building that you saw. And uh, here's Pat O'Day comes into the situation. Uh, Boyd Grafmeyer was the personification of the hippie alternate lifestyle promoter stuff. And Pat O'Day was the personification of the top 40 DJ and uh, teen dance concert promoter and he he was did the drive time at the number one radio station in Seattle and uh, had his finger in all kinds of pies and I, I read his autobiography a couple of years ago and that was the first time where I read that he was he found Boyd as his front and was behind all of the Eagle stuff at the time. And here's a thing from the Peter, I'm not sure you pronounce his name, Blecha? Blecha? Yes, Blecha. Blecha. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the devil himself, Pat O'Day, who had been the secret financer behind a prominent local concert promoter, unnamed, who was Seattle's version of Bill Graham, who'd been doing concerts at the Eagles Hall. I, I got into a huge talk uh, with a guy, argument with a guy when I was handing out stuff for, uh, about how the music should be free, nobody should pay for it, and Pat O'Day and those kind of people are money grubbers. So anyway, I interviewed Boyd for the, my school paper, which came out in March. I went to my first Eagle show in February, which could have been where I got the idea to do that uh, article. And I uh, went also to see Muddy Waters and Spirit, and they had these other ones there. There's this other one. I saw Paul Butterfield uh, 10 years after was there. Albert King with Delaney and Bonnie opening. Uh, and I was there and I recall that Leon Russell and Eric Clapton were sidemen for Delaney and Bonnie. And they were both sidemen for them for some period of time, but I can't find anything that says that they were at that show. At that Taj Mahal show, um, he brought Sun House out on the break, who was a legendary Mississippi blues guy. I graduated from high school in June and I called uh, Boyd's office up and said, do you need any help there this summer? Because I'm not doing anything. And they said, sure, come by. So I got to 
be a volunteer uh, helper for them for the Seattle Pops Festival. That's what we were mostly working on that summer, which took place in between these two shows uh, on, Ju on June 25th, 6th and 7th, like I said. And two weeks from today, I want to give a talk about that. And I know Bob Gudgel has some pictures and I have some too that I want to incorporate. So anyway, um, my job a after the festival was over, um, which I didn't work at, I was just in the audience, uh, but I got in for free, saved $18. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to come and work at the at Eagles. And so I said, sure. So I remember absolutely sitting on stage for the Jethro Tull Black Snake show. Um, I was sitting basically behind the speakers in a chair to keep people from sitting on the stage because that was a, that had been a popular thing. The, the people could just wander up on stage and hang out and fill the stage basically if they wanted to. And somehow they got tired of that. So they hired me and another guy. They didn't hire me, that was volunteer too. Um, but God, I got to see all of these really great shows. And uh, it went on for a while here. And I don't know what to say about any of these. I could talk about a bunch of these for a long time, but that would be a, a waste of time. I think you can read all of this. I sat next to Steve Miller's wife for a couple days. As, as he was playing. The thing I remember about the Steve Miller show was that he set up a, a guitar speaker at the very back of the hall, hanging from the balcony rail and had a speaker cable uh, tip sleeve going all the way to the back from his foot pedal. And he could route his signal to the back of the room when he wanted to. And it was like this big effect. Oh my God, it was crazy. <clears throat> so, uh, then, you had one of Gordon's microphones for that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, my, my cousin was Jethro Tull's A&R guy. Is that right? Yeah. I, All right. I still can, I still actually think somewhere I've got Ian Anderson's phone number somewhere, even today. Wow. Does he have Ian Anderson's phone number still? Does Ian no, have it still? I'm afraid, but I've got a lot of his stuff. But I actually know Ian Anderson fairly well from some of the classes wow. I was doing a few years ago. He was um, amazing. He stayed in Scotland for quite a long time. And uh, yeah, he's quite a see some dude. He's a really interesting guy. It was amazing to sit about 10 or 12 feet from this guy who was going nuts on the flute and dancing all over the place and uh, doing his thing. And and I told my him. Life, Aqualung was one of the yeah? uh, key vectors, along with Harlan Ellison, that shifted me out of my evangelical background. All right. So it was. Uh, high, you know, and remarkable. This Fleetwood Mac show, this one was the last one that Peter uh, Green played at, apparently, according to this album, that this Seattle show was his last one, uh, this bootleg. And I remember seeing that Wem stuff that they brought, but I don't exactly remember watching it from the stage. I more remember watching it from the room. But anyway, that was when it was. And I got to shake B.B. King's hand and tell him how awesome it was. And Retina Circus did all the light shows at Eagles when I was there. And that was my style of light show, basically. And then they kept that that winter, they kept giving me and other people these boxes of 5,000 flyers to hand out. And I spent a hell of a long time handing out flyers, and they, they were not into paying me. They actually paid me $10 for the B.B. King show because uh, a guy jumped up on the stage, an old black guy jumped up on the stage, which was about five feet tall, and was sitting on the stage. And part of my job was to keep people from being on the stage. So I went up and was hap smiling at him and talking to him and saying, you know, this, I hope you're okay. And do you have any problems? And he said, no, I'm okay. I just needed to get out. And I said, well, you can't stay here on the stage. You can either come over to the side here with me or you can go back down in the audience, but you can't stay here. This is while BB is playing. And, uh, he said, well, I'll just jump back down on the audience. So I helped him get down and got away and people 
who hired me like that and gave me a roll of quarters, a ten dollar roll of quarters. And that was the only time I got paid for any of that. And I didn't want to hand out 5,000 flyers anymore. So that was my last show. And I didn't find out until looking all of this stuff up that the shows went on there. There was some that were postponed, uh, some that were canceled. And I'll point out that May 1 through 8 of 1970 was the student strike and the Kent State people who were killed were killed then. And the marches in Seattle that took over the freeway and stuff were in there. So then these other ones were canceled and that was the last one in June of 70. And I had no idea that they must have been on the ropes financially. And I think I added something. Well, I didn't to this one, I guess. But uh, that is the presentation. Any questions? Just so different from what was happening in the UK at the same time. You know, yeah. um, you know, bands like Jethro Tull and Pink Floyd and the Yes and bands like that, they were all playing in places like the Marquee Club. Now, the Marquee Club's got a reputation that far, far, far exceeds what it was. You know, the building <laughs> I'm in right now is way bigger than the Marquee Club. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that, that was the, you know, that, that is the reality, you know, of what it was like over here, you know. It was a pretty crazy time. It was um, amazing to have been part of that in, in the tiny way that I was, but I was sitting right on the stage. It was nuts. I sat on the stage in the Marquee Club and watched, um, uh, you know, Jethro Tull, for example, play, you know, as a 12-year-old. Wow. Wow. That must have been really cool. <laughs> you know, I also I had... Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't think it was cool at the time. It was just, oh, I've got to go here because Andrew's working down here. I'm out of school. I need to go over. And he, you know, his, I didn't like his girlfriend at the time. And so I went with him instead of staying with her, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, I had a comment about Steve Miller. Um, I certainly had no contact with him back then, but uh, a few years ago, he was actually going to be playing in Seattle, and I contacted him about the possibility of recording him, and he was kind enough to get back to me and say, no, I, I don't allow my, my shows to be recorded, and then, but, but then he had gotten back to me, and at the show, I actually went to the show, and um, at the show, he actually made a statement before he played that there had been someone from the Experience Museum Project, or the EMP as it's called here, or as it was called here, um, that, that wanted to buy his combination guitar-sitar instrument from him after the show so that they could put it on display in the museum. And he said, I actually play this instrument and no, you can't have it. And I wrote, I just felt compelled to write him an email after the show saying, thank you for standing up to EMP and telling them that it, musical instruments don't belong in a museum. I, I, they should be played. You're absolutely right. And thank you. <laughs> Cool. There are musical instruments in the EMP, or they used to be. I'm yeah, sorry? Lots of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them you yeah. can play. Yeah. There's this pile of guitars in there that can't be played. Well, I think you. I think it plays if you turn, it's like a machine. You can turn it on and it plays. Yeah. But you can't play it. Back, but there's a few of them, yeah. I worked on right. the guitar tuner for that. Isn't that Trimpin's deal? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Falls and Bridges or something. It, the name doesn't fit it. It could do so much more than it than he. His stuff could have done so much more cool things, and they didn't. But that's okay. Dan, yeah. question about Beautiful yeah. Day. There were two shows I think that you said you were at with, when Beautiful Day was playing. Yeah, I think so. Uh, back in the day, I had sold David Laflame his uh, violin speakers, if you will, which is a pretty big JBL rig for the day. And I'm wondering if you remember the backline stuff at all. When he would hit an E string, you could hear it a mile away. 
So I'm just curious if that was anything that you remember from back in those days. I don't recall anything specific, no. Okay, fair enough. I, I remember Lee Michaels, who was an organist, having no Leslie and having about six or eight of those uh, acoustic 360 and mm -hmm. 300 guitar amp and bass amp. Lee plays loud. Um, yes, it was very loud. Yeah, he got to a point of near deafness, actually. Mm. It was crazy. I had to wear earplugs. and, and he, I did, Unfortunately, he didn't. Yeah, I did that after, because would, they would have me sometimes help move the, the gear between sets, not always, but sometimes. And uh, I was moving something for jo Joe Johansson, and my ear was right next to his amp and he hit some note and it was like right through my brain and after that i had earplugs every single time thank you for the trip down memory lane that was great fun yeah sure i'm surprised when i got that 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 pdf that you sent out i'm surprised that you were old enough i didn't know you were that old i'm old man you you must be chin's age stay off my lawn chin's a couple years older than me i think Ah, uh, okay. So you still got some time left. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, so that's that. Uh, if there's no further questions, let's go. I on. have a question for Rick, if that's okay. Good. Um, I was wondering, were those recordings on at seven and a half or fifteen? And then, uh, what tubes were you using in the mixer, if you recall? Oh, okay. The um. Um, I did. I always really did my, good. Thank you. I always did my recording at seven and a half, and that was a consumer machine, so it couldn't even run at fifteen on a on a in a dream. Um, the uh, the mixer was uh, I think it was mostly twelve AX sevens, and it was a, a a two stage amp with feedback from plate to cathode for the from the second stage back to the first stage. I could sketch it out and send it to you. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, high impedance faders, I'm assuming? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, you know, that's, that's what hippies could afford. Right. Um, let's see, some of the, some of the preamps were um, these uh, Western Electric dual triodes that I found at my favorite surplus store. They were basically just a Western Electric 12AX7, but um, I figured out what the basing was and built a preamp around them because it was a tube and it worked. So what else can I tell you? Thank you. All right, anything else before we move on? Oh, actually, Rick, I'm curious, have you uh, ever tried to contact those bands to say hey i've got these recordings from 1967 yeah one um i've been in touch with uh the the magic fern and uh and the widow of the of one of the guitar players from the flash but a, a lot of these people are dead and gone didn't you say some of those came out on albums some of your recordings yeah the um the daily the a guy who had a local record store uh, actually put out an official recording of of the flash which was a compilation of um, my cantaloupe island recording and then several things that they had done in studios and it was called um i flash daily hmm. <laughs> hey rick this is ed yeah. yeah, Daily Flash, weren't they playing it like Grinders for a while? And I'm now out here in Connecticut, and so I guess Grinders is closed down. They're playing like once a month. Are they still kicking around? Yeah, they're still kicking around, and they play. They they did play it. They were kind of the house band at Grinders, and that was in the U District on Roosevelt. No, uh, up in Aurora. No, oh. up toward the Aurora Village. Okay. Yeah, not quite the two twentieth. Okay. Um, one other quick quick one for you, Rick. Did Herschel Klepper work electrograph at one time? I know he did all the Ampex stuff later on. The repair guy I for Ampex. So. I think so. But I'm not sure. He wasn't he wasn't known to me then when I worked there. And 
Um, uh, I knew Glenn White Jr. and Glenn White Sr. from that era. Interesting. You were you did the sound there from the, those early shows until that one where you left. Do you know when Doc Exnazi got involved? No. Okay. I mean, it was it was after. Yeah. And I I remember visiting uh, the hall when I was home on leave uh, during my incarceration and yeah. Um, that must have and been I when saw I saw the new you. system. Yeah, that must have been when I saw you. You came okay. by to see it, and I don't know what I would have been doing there, because it was in yeah. the afternoon sometime. It must have been before right. the show or something. Yeah, well, it was in the afternoon. It wasn't. There wasn't a show. Okay. And I what think Doc I was been? around. Yeah. Because I, I remember think him Doc showing you around. Led the tour. Yeah. And that was that. And yeah. you know, um, when I got out. Um, and after my um, after my tenure with Rube, um, Boyd tried to resurrect the the concert scene there, hmm. and he called he called Charlie and I to do it. Hmm. Charlie and Morgan. So yeah, so we did. I don't remember how many shows there. Maybe maybe it was six months worth. It was. Hmm. He actually paid us, and we were able to use the money to make the PA larger. Hmm. When was that? Well, I'm guessing, you know, 72, 73, around there. Oh, really? That much later? Um, maybe, maybe it was even 1974. I think, well, you know, I'm, I, I could be completely ass wrong here. It may have been after I started working at TAPCO, which was 1975. Um, but, and let's see, the mixers we had were made by, uh, who Dave Harrison actually. Mm. And, uh, he had a, a little company that was trying to make rock and roll mixers called Pandora. And he had a inexpensive 12 channel mixer that he called a motherboard. Mm. We had two of them and we had a way to parallel the outputs and that was it. What I left out of my talk that I realized, I, I went into Eagles twice after 670. Um, I did a light show in 1971, I think, at the second Earth Day there, as there was some event that didn't happen. I, I mean, it happened, but there nobody showed up. And I was up in the balcony pointing sideways at the screen because I didn't have long throw devices. And then in November of 1980, I did sound and lights for the Jim McDermott victory party. He was a Democrat running for governor in the Republican sweep that year of almost every place. So it was a pretty down, down event and the sweetest part of it was that there's an elevator that's up on the third floor of the building and there's a freight elevator to get up there. And by the time it was over and I was all packed up, there was nobody else in the building, period, and nobody to to run the elevator. So I had to wheel all of my stuff down, the, down those ramps to the street. And I was using 4550s in those days, uh, plus uh, and, and two of my 44550 JBL low frequency boxes were knockoffs made by somebody with using particle board. So they were even heavier than the actual ones. And I was there by myself because it wasn't going to be a big paying gig and it wasn't a big deal. And I didn't get out of there until six in the morning. Uh, and that was fun too. Character building done. Yes, yes, that's that's the reason I'm like this. Sorry, Gordon. <laughs> so, uh, Same, been there, got this. Yes, yes, yes. So, hey, Dan, were yes. there any in that late '60s, early '70s period of time, uh, commercial PA companies, 
can you think of any? Uh, you know, I don't know when Greg Paisley did his RMS sound. I know my partner Greg Boykin at Interface Acoustics came later. Oh, Boykin, and, and, and yeah. investigating and investigating Bill Hanley and understanding that history, thinking about you know Northwest Sound and and yes. you know all these companies. And then when I got involved was about you know 77, 78, but but those that preceded me. Um, and I think. You're looking a little bit familiar to me in the regard that the equipment you got behind me, I had heard that there was a tube studio in the U District back in the 70s. Was that you? No. Late 70s? No, this, I'm, I've never had a studio. What you're seeing behind me is the 30th Street studio in New York City. Uh, okay. But uh, C CBS. Yes, yeah, CBS. CBS. Studio. The, the okay. sound companies I remember, um, certainly Charlie Morgan, Morgan Sound. Sound. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Larry Rickstein had a, a big company early on, fairly early on. And, Audio Graphic uh, Systems. That was Larry's? Yeah. Yeah. Larry Charlie Gary. started out with two. Charlie yep. went down to California to do like a hair thing with two phase linear 700s, and after a couple of weeks, it just fizzled out. <laughs> Came back to Seattle, yeah. uh, and Susan or whoever I think kind of you know got his spirits going again. But uh, he, he had um, he had a console made by Rick Kiefer at mm -hmm. Seattle West. Seattle West. Kiefer was into cloning Spectrosonics uh, cards, and so. <laughs> Charlie had this mixer that Kiefer made, and um, Kiefer didn't pay complete attention to everything that needed to be done. <laughs> and uh, the thing worked, but it really should never have gone on the road. And he got it to Los Angeles, and the thing started oscillating. And he had to hire Richard Guy at no small expense to come in and fix it. And... Um, yeah, and I, I don't remember everything else about that tour, but it, it was uh, disastrous, I think, is a good place to start. <laughs> Your picture of the Ampex M10 reminded me of the uh, John Curl story with Grateful Dead and the Wall of Sound, where Curl had designed a system, Osley Stanley decided to run batteries directly to it, blew it up, they went back to the M1, M10s, they sound a lot better, and then um, as a result of all this, well, I should say during that era, Levinson had come, Mark Levinson had come to Curl when he was working at Ampex in 66 and wanted a tape duplicated, and that's how they first met. And Curl needed some low noise amplifiers built, and that's how he and, you know, Levinson got a bit involved during that wall of, you know, that uh, Grateful Dead system. But ultimately, Dick Berwin took the same design that Curl had, but used different capacitors. And this was before understanding dielectric absorption and, and those effects with electrolytics and uh, ceramic disc caps was well known. Um, so there's you know, certainly some history there. The, built, the front of the house, when the question came up about where your position was, in that book of Hamley's, he was the guy that, you know, cl you know all these claims, one of which was that he was the first guy to do front of do a front of house position, and uh, in America, in yeah. America, okay, yeah, yeah. And the SM57 awesome. and 58, is it, the SM57 and 58s are ones that he takes credit for taking some old unit in, I don't know, 545 or something, right. and asking for individual parts to construct that. But you know, right. uh, I think he he did a little Lyndon Johnson inaugural with with some of those microphones. But, yep. um, well, that might have been when when the uh, presidential microphone switched from being RCA. Well, they went from RCA through ElectroVoice, and then they finally settled on the double shores. Mm -hmm. well, one other guy that uh, whose name comes to mind here in the Seattle area was Bob Munger, with his yeah. uh, you know Alltech and GreenLake. What was that? High Fire Audio. Right. which is a place where Dean Nissen had started out before he went to work at Phase One Year um, and ultimately service manager there. So it was Munger, other than just selling all tech stuff, you know, doing any other work that you're aware of? I have a schematic no. for an early Phase 700 that he did, um, which he claims Carver never – he had a, a letter, you know, thanking him for all the work, but he never got paid. At least that was his claim. <laughs> Uh, um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Bob Munger. What would Bob Munger and Bob Carver have to do with each other? 
There was an amplifier. Um, this would have been the ones that went to Kelly DeYoung, uh, ultimately. So I have the, the very first 700 was actually a bridge amp. It was a four-channel PC board bridge down to two channels. This was early 1970. And Bob actually took four amps up to Canada and did a Strawberry Mountain Fair in May of 1970. The phase linear amplifiers were not introduced to the public until the real the first ad appeared in audio magazine December 1970. Mm-hmm. And the last um, Macintosh clinic that he took the amplifiers to, because he'd been taking them to, you know, David Bryan would come out to Seattle basically three times a year was in January 15th, 71, and the PL-171 board that was used in the Phase 700s is January 71. So I've got ones that predate this. Um, it's funny, because in the Hanley book, they said that the Phase linears were used at Woodstock. They couldn't possibly have been. No, it didn't um, say so. that. It didn't say that. Yeah, it said Crown DC-300s and Phase linears on others. I've, no. I sent John Kane. no. No, it was uh, Macintoshes. Yeah, Big Macs. Yeah, so Macintoshes are mentioned in the book, but phase yes. linears are specifically as well mentioned in the book. Boy, and I'll I'm trying to get I don't recall seeing that at all. Yeah. Okay. Is that in the last seat of go the, the house? Back, go to, excuse me? Is that in the last seat of the house book? Yes. Um, if you go, it's phase linears uh, in the back of the book, which does identify Crown DC 300s. Just look at all the pages. You'll find one of the pages that does mention Macintosh DC 300s and phase linears, and it's in the same context uh, uh, of being there potentially during the Woodstock, hmm. which couldn't have, couldn't have been. Bob couldn't have been. Couldn't, couldn't have been. been. David Laidley and Bob had been, uh, been together for some time. You know, Bob had been working on this. Um, guys like Roger Rosenbaum and Ray Weichel were were very helpful in Bob's learning curve in electronics back in that era. That book is really terrific, but there are a number of egregious mistakes in it, like saying that the the woofer is fine as long as you don't put low frequencies through it, which will blow it up or something like that, <laughs> and, and other things equally egregious. Um, so John talks at great length about how he's not a PA or a sound engineer, and unfortunately, really nobody John he Hanley. was. What? John what? Hanley said that. No, John, John Kane, Kane, the author. Bill Hanley is the Bill. is the sound guy. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So they're they're going to do a talk for the AES convention that will be online in October, and we're working out exactly what that'll be. So. Bill Hanley turned up at one of the lab meet things that Bennett Prescott put on a good few years ago now. Cool. Uh, he, he's fun man, yeah. He cool. is really fun. Ah, oh, he's a cool guy. Like you know, I mean, it was really interesting. And we got chatting about the kind of Woodstocky, yeah, you know, M era and, the, and his era, and uh, what's his name, Bob, Bob Leonard was there as well. Oh he yeah. Turned up. And of course, Bob been playing in bands and doing us whatever since you know, you know, early sixties, I guess. Uh, I was just getting them all started about that, you know. I was so surprised to learn that Woodstock was done with sure vocal master mixers. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't call those vocal master mixers. Yeah, they were M67s. They were M67s, <laughs> which like is vocal. of that era, but certainly not the same circuit. True. Oh, I don't know. They're not the Altex you probably had at the Eagles. No, or they weren't. weren't. They weren't. No, I mean, there's pictures of Hanley's uh, uh, mixing setup, and you can clearly see their M67s. Yes. Oh, look like there's a not, vocal. Not vocal yeah. smashers. No, they're not vocal smashers. But the but reason for that. Very, very small box with about yes. five knobs on each yeah. one. Four. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah, the reason for that was that they had some custom, he had some custom built mixers built for Woodstock. Mm-hmm. And they got the one ahead of time, and it worked great, and everything was cool. And they got the second one the day of the loading the truck or something. And they got there, and there was a hum or something that they couldn't get rid of, and there was no way to use it. So he gave the working one to the recording guys because he was supplying the recording gear, too. And he used a bunch of M67s for the PA. 
So that, that was well, that was story. Eddie Kramer doing the recording, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I talked to Hanley at the last AES convention. He, he uh, John Kane was there to sign his book, or, or to to push his book, and it, it was not out yet. And uh, uh, Hanley was there because he's at AES conventions, and John wanted him to hang out in the booth, I guess. And I got to talking with him, and he was apparently tired of just sitting there. And we talked for. T a solid two hours and he, we went off away from the booth and just were going back and forth about all of this amazing stuff that he had done which I was eager to hear about and give him reasonably intelligent questions other than what was it like being at Woodstock. And, uh, <laughs> Dave, uh, Dave Ratt and, uh, and, and, and Hanley were, were fun to have in the same room for a while. I bet. Uh, it was it was it was really really interesting to sit and listen to these guys talking about some of the because Dave had been doing some stuff about his how he was messing around with different ways of doing subs for you know guiding mm. the sound yes. around which was yes. totally completely and utterly at odds with what everybody else had been saying that weekend yes. uh, and Hanley and him you know were just agreeing in so many ways and it was it was really interesting. <laughs> Not so much because they shot the other guys down, but it was really interesting seeing these two guys agreeing and, you know, talking through it. You know, you've got extreme, you know, the absolute extremes. You've got, you know, Hanley's, you know, been doing it in 1967. Ratty Boy wasn't even born then. Like, you know, I mean, well, he was, <laughs> but he was a kid at school, you know, bring it. if he'd hit kindergarten, but then I doubt it, you know. And it was really interesting watching them talk about all. And then, of course, it disappeared off into all sorts of esoteric stuff. You know, as you can imagine, about seven or eight hours. We didn't go to bed that day till about four in the morning. These two were rapping away. It was brilliant. I wish somebody had recorded it. Where was this? In near Boston, in Massachusetts. Uh, what was the occasion? Uh, lab Bennett Prescott was oh, in Bennett's the lab, thing. And I've forgotten the name of the other guy. Um, it was somebody who did sound over there. Uh, between him and Bennett, they put the thing together, and it was it was quite good. I, I flew over. I, at that time, wow. I had a private pilot's license, and I you know used it as an excuse to fly across the Atlantic and um, you flew a plane across the Atlantic yeah yeah we flew a small aircraft Jesus. across the Atlantic. it was good Jesus fun. Gordon uh, it was a good excuse to get over there and um, we we flew down and I, I went to that and my friend that flew over with me he disappeared off and went away and played an aircraft museum <laughs> for the rest of the summer the rest of that day you know cool 